Are you ready? Yes, we started on the topic of pregnancy. We've seen a couple of miscarriages, and I think we've also seen a couple of prophetic pregnancy. And uh, we'll start with miscarriage. By definition, miscarriage will be said to be expulsion or extraction of a fetus that is less than 500 grams. Now, when we weigh baby in the labor room, you have an idea of what 500 grams looks like on that scale, right? The smallest baby will probably weigh this, maybe 1.5 or so. Maybe that was born in March. Now, imagine, you know how small that child was. Imagine a child of 500 grams, or imagine half a kilo of meat. That is quite small. So a fetus that is expelled at that weight is said to be a miscarriage. That's one definition. The other definition is when the pregnancy is lost before 28 weeks of gestation. You know, we calculate gestational age from the day of the last menses. Four weeks after is four weeks. Another eight weeks after is eight weeks gestational age. So, so 28 weeks will be probably around seven months, a little less than seven months. So any pregnancy loss before then is a miscarriage, at least for Nigeria. <clears throat> Why I said at least for Nigeria is we don't have the facility to take care of any pregnancy less than that. In Western world, you would still take a baby of 20 weeks and believe 20 weeks is five months. In some other places, their own is 24 weeks. Uh, you understand? But for Nigeria, if you have to define it as in Nigeria, it's pregnancy loss before 28 weeks gestation. So what are the common causes? Um, there are three major causes, and there are sometimes you don't have a cause. There's something called chromosomal defect, we just discuss cells. So you know what a chromosome is, the basic building block of your DNA, the basic building block of the nucleus that will now form the genetic traits. So chromosomal defect in the baby is like nature's way of preventing a mother from having an abnormal baby. So such fetuses will come out as a miscarriage, especially if it happens before the first 13 weeks. That's in the first three months. After 13 weeks, there are some other causes. Could be an accident, could be the mother was sick, could be that she was kicked in the belly. But in the first 13 weeks, one common cause is chromosome abnormality in the fetus. Then another common cause is corpus luteum defect. Now, the corpus luteum is what supports, provides hormonal support in the first 13 weeks of the pregnancy before the mother's hormone will kick in and be able to continue the later phase of the pregnancy. If there's any defect, essentially it's like a progesterone defect. The pregnancy may not be well supported and may end up coming out as a miscarriage. Then for placentation, placentation the placenta that is all sitting well, is not well embedded. It can fall off and come out as a miscarriage. So essentially, the causes could be, is it the mother's, is it a problem with the mother? Is it a problem with the fetus? In which case I told you it's oftentimes genetically abnormal. Is it a problem with the uterus, the womb in itself? Some other problem with the uterus could be scarring, a uterus that has had a lot of evacuation, but would be badly scarred. <coughs> Excuse me. A uterus that has had <coughs> a uterus that have had fibroid surgeries or several surgeries, there could be scarring such that it will not allow for easy attachment of the placenta. Yeah, that's what I meant by it could be a problem with the womb, it could be a problem with the fetus itself, it could be a problem with the mother, maybe the hormonal supply is not adequate. So what are the common ones, the common types? Because miscarriage is not just miscarriage. There is a particular type of miscarriage that a woman will have. The threatened miscarriage. We had a patient on bed that was around for a week, or thereabouts, I think five days, she was spotting, was pregnant, and she had some cramps. That was a threatened miscarriage. Threatened just means it wants to happen. It's about to happen. Or you, you may still be able to do something medically to prevent the eventuality from happening. So such individuals, they, they may spot, they may have cramps. But when you do a scan, the internal horse, the 
service has the internal host and the external host. That's where the baby will pass through to come out. The internal host is closed. If it's closed, it's threatening miscarriage. If it's open, you see it's inevitable. So that's the first one for miscarriage. So it's not everyone who is pregnant and is bleeding that would ultimately lose the pregnancy. For some, you may be able to do something to arrest it. So you see someone who is bleeding who has cramps, send them to the hospital quickly. The herpes is just threatening and we may be able to stop it. Then the second one is inevitable. Still the same symptom of threatened. She's, she's bleeding or spotting. She has cramps that feels like very bad menstrual pain. Then you do a scan. The internal horse is open, meaning the cervix is opened. There's no drug that will close a cervix. So keeping on bed may not achieve much. You, you understand? Or you do a scan and there's no fetal heartbeat. So she's bleeding, she has cramps, the fetus is dead. That's inevitable. There's no point continuing such a pregnancy. So you just help them complete process of the miscarriage that has already been sent it, set in place. Then incomplete is some fetal products or some products of the pregnancy, product of conceptus has been lost. She has bled, she has had cramps, she still she may still be having cramps, she may still be bleeding. But then you do a scan, an ultrasound scan, and you find some products there. That's when we say it's an incomplete miscarriage. For those ones, you need to do something to get out whatever product is left. Then complete is, she, the woman already bled a lot. She will probably tell you she has already passed some product. That she already expelled some product. Then by the time you do this scan, the uterus is empty. That's a complete miscarriage. Other than the supportive care you, want, you may want to give as a medical personnel, there's nothing more that needs to be done. Then missed miscarriage, this is a tricky one. What I said is a tricky one is she may never have bled, she may never have had cramps, she just felt okay, maybe the baby is not moving, or she came for a routine ultrasound scan and you find the baby dead. That is still a loss of pregnancy, it's just that it's lost within. Remember, we said it's pregnancy loss before 28 weeks, so it's still a pregnancy loss. She was unaware of it, that's what makes it a missed miscarriage. Medical care is to make plans to get it out, either by induction or by evacuation, as the case may be. Then septic miscarriage would follow a couple of things. Would be that she had an incomplete. Many times is that she had an incomplete. Inevitable is oftentimes discovered early that you can do something about it, that the individual should not get septic. But she had an incomplete miscarriage, she was unaware. So you have dead tissues, like product of conceptus within the uterus. And you can have infection ascending up. That could become a septic, a septic miscarriage. Or someone who goes for an induced abortion. You understand what I'm talking about? Goes for an induced abortion or a surgical abortion and it wasn't well done. Or there was infection introduced in the procedure, in the process. Such an individual has a septic, in this case now we will not say septic miscarriage, it is a septic abortion. It will be a very deadly condition if it's not managed well. So how do you diagnose a case of miscarriage? Your interest is the patient's symptoms, which is the clinical findings. Of course, after you've had all the normal vital signs, what are complaints have been bringing? I've been having some cramps, and some of them will come with very, very bad pain. Then you do a scan that then tells you what you're dealing with. Most of them will have a history of spotting cramps, except for the missed miscarriage, which may not have any symptoms, just came for a routine check. But has a history of spotting cramps, has a positive pregnancy test, you do a scan, us is closed. What do you call that one? If the us is closed, Threatened. It means it wants, to, it wants to happen, you may still be able to stop it. Horse is closed, baby is still alive. That's a threatening miscarriage. You do a scan, baby is alive, but the horse is opened. What is that? Inevitable. There's nothing you can do about it. You do a scan, there's no fetus there, but you have some placenta tissues there. What is that? 
incomplete. That's incomplete. So you will need to help the person get it out. Now this person came in, is not bleeding, is not having cramps, just came for scan. Baby is dead. What's that? The missed miscarriage. Get the point. So now after you've come to the diagnosis and you know this is what this individual has, how do you then go about managing it? You will need some blood work. <clears throat> Your interest is what's this person's resource factor. Because if she is resource negative, whether she bets the baby or she has a miscarriage, she needs rogam. So that she will not become sensitized to subsequent pregnancies that may be resource positive and be having serial miscarriages or have babies that come out very sick. So she needs rogam as soon as possible. Then she will need blood level checked. This CV. She would need full blood count rather. Full blood count helps you know is the blood level low because of course she's been bleeding for a while. And the white blood cell count tells you would this thing be infected already? Because you don't know how long she's been bleeding, you don't know what else she's done, so you will need a full blood count. And of course, you will need a screening VDRL, you need general hepatitis B and the likes. Should you need to transfuse, that's one. Then, just like a general all encompassing test, that's an opportunity for you to know the health status of this individual. So, the way you go about it could either be medical or by evacuation. And um, for someone who whose horse is already opened, who is bleeding but is not massive, whose blood level is okay, whose vital signs are still within normal. You're not scared that this patient is in shock or going to shock at any time. You're not scared that she's lost too much blood or she's dehydrated. You can attempt to go the medical route. The medical route is misoprostol. What misoprostol does is, one, it helps the cervix to soften and open. Then it also has a contractile effect on the uterus and may be able to help push out the product of conceptus. Now you have someone who has an incomplete. The thing has passed on its on its own and not all came out. A medical approach may not be the best, except the patient tells you, I don't want to be evacuated, so give me some medication. It's still the misoprostol. So if you have access that all the other things are normal, we are not at risk of taking four to six hours. For this product to come out, so you still give me so personal. If it's a missed miscarriage, you know here there's no spotting, there's no bleeding, everything looks good. You may still want to go with me so personal. Then of course such a patient has to be around, like an induction, to see if she would expel on her own. She may end up expelling the whole thing on her own, or you may need to help her evacuate to whatever is left. That's why I said is it a medical or surgical? So it's not everybody who has a miscarriage that must automatically be evacuated because sometimes patients will come and will tell you they didn't have an evacuation that they have a feeling that something may still be left you understand so it's not everybody that will need that so what are the possible complications let me hear you what are the possible complications of a miscarriage Before she dies, something else will happen before she dies. I already mentioned one complication. I've mentioned more than one. So. What could happen? Okay, so she could have a lot of blood loss. Yes, what else could happen? Yeah. That is if if she was evacuated by someone who doesn't know what she's doing. As if she was evacuated by someone who, do, who doesn't know what he or she is doing. Is she at risk of infections? If she has incomplete and was undiagnosed, is she has risk of, at risk of infections? She's at risk of infections, even if she has evacuation done. At risk, she's at risk of infections because it's an invasive procedure. If she bleeds a lot before she comes into the hospital, what could happen to the kidneys?
Were you around for the patient we had um, yesterday also? Can she have acute kidney injury from a lot of blood loss? Any amount of blood loss that will put a patient in a state of shock, the first organ you're concerned about is the kidney. After you have resuscitated, has the kidney been injured? So she's at risk of an acute renal failure. Of course, she's at risk of low blood level that may lead to transmission, which is anemia. She's at risk of psychological trauma. You have some people who have miscarriage and they are not the same again. From there, they sink into depression, they are suicidal and the likes. Then there could also be a risk of infertility if it was poorly done, if the evacuation procedure was poorly done, if it was done by quack, I mean, for those who go for induced abortion, and then, as you said, then have a damage to the uterus. Those are the possible complications that could follow miscarriage. Do we understand miscarriage? Okay, so now let's go to ectopic pregnancy. Ectopic pregnancy essentially means pregnancy that is outside the uterus, outside the endometrium of the uterus. Are we together? Pregnancies should implant within the endometrial cavity of the uterus. Anything outside of this location, regardless of how close it is to the endometrium, is an ectopic pregnancy. So you could have tubal ectopic. Tubal ectopic is in the tubes. You could have ligamentous is in, within the ligaments that suspends the uterus. It could be within the ovary. Some ectopics have been found in the abdominal cavity. It's not even in the uterus. You have a baby attached to the placenta, to the um, intestinal tissues. And research has shown that some babies were carried to town. Just that the process of delivery is a very, um, is a high risk procedure because placenta tissue on the um, intestinal tissue is not a natural procedure. So the process of separation may be a weird one. You could have bleeding, do you want to suture the intestine and all sorts of weird things to be concerned about. Then an ectopic pregnancy can also sit in the cervix. Cervix is the part we examine when the baby wants to be delivered. That is not where the baby should sit. So most of those pregnancies eventually would rupture, put the woman's life at risk. Pregnancy is lost, so now we're trying to save the woman from dying. And some common causes <coughs> could be a embryo now, maybe an issue with the embryo itself in the process of implantation. And it could also be maternal. A woman with a previous history of pelvic inflammatory disease that has scarred the tubes. In the process of the fertilized embryo coming through the tubes to be implanted into the endometrial cavity. If there is scarring along the way, it will get trapped at that scarred point. It gets trapped, then it sits and implants there. Now that's not a natural place because the tube can only grow a certain dimension. It can't grow big enough to accommodate a baby. So many times around eight weeks, such implanted fetus would rupture. Then a woman with endometriosis, a lady who, a woman who has had tubal surgery. Tubal surgery, again, any surgery done on the tube could also scar the tubes. If it scars the tube, there could be narrowing of the opening of that tube that the embryo that is coming to be implanted can be implanted at the wrong place. Then high BF, because of all of the hormonal imputes, some of those hormonal imputes can slow the process of implantation then even the process of sitting the fertilized um, ovum that was fertilized in a petri dish, now sitting it into the endometrial cavity, maybe they may sit wrongly, not intentionally though, but that's a possible risk of um, in vitro fertilization. Then a woman who has been on hormones, um, common hormones that can be a risk factor for such is a lady who is pregnant, who takes um, post pills, they contain high dose progesterone. It can slow the movement of 
the fertilized egg from a planting so it gets trapped because there are certain days at which a fertilized ovum should implant once the day kicks in and the fertilized ovum has not arrived within the endometrial cavity wherever it gets to it begins to implant so while those hormonal medications will slow that process wherever the fertilized egg then gets to on the day of implantation it implants there that's why some of those hormonal medications can cause that then IUC, the intrauterine contraceptive device. These are devices that you put within the endometrial cavity to prevent pregnancy. They've also been said to be possible risk factors for an ectopic pregnancy. So just what I, would, what I just want you to know is the causes are many. Sometimes you find a cause for a woman. Sometimes you don't find a cause. But you're concerned because most people will come in as an emergency. Because some people don't know they are pregnant, some people know they are pregnant and they assume that it is sitting in the correct place. It is only maybe when the person then passes out because they've been having abdominal pain, they've been bleeding into the abdominal cavity, blood level is really low, blood pressure has gone, out, gone down and she passes out. That's when she gets rushed to the hospital. That's when you then begin to run some tests and it's it's expected that if the doctor is suspicious enough, has a high index of suspicion, you'll be able to say, okay, this is ectopic without wasting time. Because sometimes they could very well go for days, for hours, without knowing this is ectopic. This individual continues to bleed into the abdominal cavity. That I say, it could be life and death in the wrong hands without a quick diagnosis. So now the clinical presentation could be acute. Acute are the ones that will come very dramatic. She was at a party. She complained of abdominal pain. And within two hours, she's passed out and she's unconscious. So acute means it just ruptured that time. She bled a lot. If the bleeding was outside, everybody would say, oh, this blood is really much. This is a serious thing. Let's get her to the hospital. But because she, they bleed into the abdominal cavity, the abdomen can contain a lot of blood. She'll just tell you, I told me it's pain here. And you see there's a bit of distension. It's when she passes out that they do an abdominal tap do a pregnancy test, do a scan that the doctor would then be able to put everything together that oh, she had an ectopic. That's what I mean by an acute. Then chronic is um, is also called slow leaking. As the fetus continues to grow wherever it is implanted, especially if it's in the tubes, there could be some micro leaks, like the tube begins to break little by little. So she will just be bleeding a little. But oftentimes you'll have complaints of a half pain on one side, a half pain on the other side. And you know, sometimes people can take things for granted with levity. That would have been a good time to come for scan to see what is causing the pain. So they, they have a slow leaking. And some of them would even have the bleeding pervaginal. So they bleed out and they assume maybe this is menses. Or they assume maybe it's a miscarriage that is happening. That's why it can be a confusing diagnosis between is it a miscarriage or is it an ectopic? especially in places where they don't have a facility for, for an ultrasound scanning. That's what I mean by chronic or slow leaking. Now there's another one called acute on chronic. So this lady has been spotting, has been having some cramps, has been bleeding slowly for a couple of days, could have been up to a week. Then no scan was done, no hospital was visited until wherever the pregnancy was sighted, it ruptures completely, then you have a large mega flow of blood at which she then passes out. It's upon arrival at the hospital, they give a history of she's been spotting, she's been having pain on the right, she's been having pain on the left. Yeah, the last message was so and so so date. She's never had a scan. Then you put two and two together and say, This is acute or chronic. She had a slow leaking ectopic, then she now had an acute um, bleed that warranted the presentation at the hospital. So now, you know, because I told you that when such an individual advising the, ad, ad, <coughs> arrives in the hospital, it's not an automatic diagnosis. You don't automatically know this is a topic because it's not written on the forehead. Some considerations in your mind could be, could this be a topic? Because, could it be miscarriage? Because I told you miscarriage will bleed, will have cramps. For slow leaking, she's been spotting for the past one week. And she's also been having cramps on the right and on the left. So you would ordinarily assume, could this be a miscarriage? Now, those who also have ovarian cysts, for some of them, when there's torsion, that's when the cysts 
twist very badly. They have very bad pains. The cyst can actually also twist and rupture. That's when they say complication of the cyst. So that could, that could also be a suspicion. Now, what will make you eventually say this is not a cyst is you do a PT, PT is positive. You do a scan, uterus is empty. You understand? A cyst, you will not have a positive PT. Are we together? Except she says she's pregnant. But by then you would want to find again the embryo or the fetus within the endometrial cavity when you do a scan. So the scan is always what would help you break even as to what is the diagnosis we are dealing with. Then, now there are also some surgical possibilities that may, you could also be thinking, could this be a surgical condition? Someone who has pains on the right, but is not spotting, and is yet to have a scan done, because she presented at a hospital where there's no scan. It may be suspecting an acute appendicitis, because pain in appendix is also on the right, and it is very severe. So that could be something, that, that could be something they could suspect. Or you have someone who comes in and comes in unconscious in a facility where they don't have opportunity for this test as quickly as possible. They could also be suspected because she have perforated something. It could be a lot of complexity of surgical suspicions. These are like differential diagnoses. It's like if it's not this, could it be this? It is your tests and your ultrasound scan that would then wrap up the diagnosis. And then um, I have some some pictures of some scan here that you get to see in your own time. But importantly is when you do this scan, especially for those who have started leaking, who have started bleeding, maybe it's acute or chronic or acute or chronic, uterus is empty. That's a, oftentimes a giveaway when you had a positive pregnancy test and she tells you the last message was two months ago. Two months ago, you expect to see it with gestation within the endometrial cavity. So uterus is empty. Then you will then see again free fluid within the pouch of Douglas. And you almost like if she's bled a lot, the uterus is literally floating. So even if you don't see the location of the ectopic on scan, you have a positive pregnancy test, your uterus is empty, you have a lot of free fluid. Your first index of suspicion then is this could be ectopic. There's a third test we then do is we, we tap the fluid. You just insert a syringe into the abdominal cavity, wherever you see the largest collection of fluid on the scan, and you tap and withdraw into a syringe. You will find blood within the syringe. Now, if it was that you went into a vessel to withdraw, the blood will cloth. If you withdraw anybody's sample in syringe, after a while it will cloth, right? But this blood doesn't clot. So by the time you put it on, on the table for a couple of minutes, I see this is not clotting again. This is a topic. That is only needed if you're still thinking, ah, maybe I'm not so sure. Let me not go and open up this patient without being very very sure. You may want to use that as a careful assessment. But otherwise, positive PT, empty uterus, you do a scan, a lot of free fluid on the scan. And she came with such a dramatic presentation. It's a topic on the otherwise proven. So you will need such a patient to have an x lab then of course close where she's bleeding from remove the ectopic and other medical care that she may need so there's also an they, they are, I, I have a couple of some youtube um sorry some ultrasound pictures for you to see because i don't know when you have an ectopic you get the privilege of seeing but it's, it's worthwhile if you see such a picture. Then now for someone who has an unruptured ectopic, so you've done the scan, uterus is empty, but you find something within the tubes. On, on ultrasound scan, the tubes will be thickened. You could find a sac. You may not have found a, a fetal pole yet. The sac is like the sac that should house the fetus. You may not have found a fetal pole, so there is consideration of am I seeing something cystic or am I seeing an ectopic? So such individual will need something called beta HCG. Beta HCG is like a quantitative assessment of your pregnancy test. Pregnancy test is beta HCG they check. It's just that they're not counting numbers. 
Are you with me? So quantitative assessment is expected that the level of that beta HCG should double every 24 hours. So if the first one, you every 48 hours rather, if the first sample you take is a 1,200, by the time you repeat it and you want to do a quantitative assessment of the beta HCG, you should expect to have 2,800. If from 1,000 to having 1,600, it really may be a failing pregnancy already or it may not be an ectopic. You understand? You could be like maybe a gestation that is still less than four weeks, that the level of the beta HCG is just mounting up. But if it's the frank ectopic and you found it there, it's expected to be at least some weeks more than four weeks, at which level the beta HCG is expected to double every 48 hours. So even if the person says, okay, I'm not sure it's an ectopic, give me some time, then you have two days to know if this thing doubles. If it doubles and that thing is still there, your decision then is, are we going some medical routes? There are some, medi me some medical management that you don't need to open such an individual up. Metotrezate is, metotrezate is one of such drugs. Um, metotrezate is a cancer and cancer medication. It's also used for some autoimmune disorders. But the way it works is it targets cells that are actively growing, whether it's cancer cells or a fetus. In a pregnant woman, what's the thing that is most actively growing in her body? the fetus so the metotrexate will target such a fetus and just eliminate such a fetus but the side effect is there's a risk of the tube being scarred in the process even if the individual had a surgery too there's also a risk of that tube eventually being scarred but when you weigh risk battles benefit of someone takes a tablet or an injection or has a surgery a tablet and an injection still has a lower risk than a surgery any day So the management will be essentially multifaceted. There is the preoperative management where you, of course, take vitals, you want to stabilize, give IV fluid, do your blood test, the same blood test you will do for um the same blood test you will do for miscarriage, your PCV, full blood count rather, your um blood group, your interest in your blood group is essentially the resource factor, is she resource negative or positive? You will be looking for Rogam for her. Then of course your viral screening, this will be your preoperative workup. Fluid to replace what she has lost. Blood as the case may be, she's really lost a lot of blood. Before you then do the operative care, of course you will take consent, which is essential. You've explained the diagnosis to the individual. You've told her the process, the procedure that she will go through and every other thing that will follow. Then of course the operative procedure and after the operative procedure, you take it from there. Okay, so do you have any questions? Yes.